which uh, begins in Mark 8, continues into Mark 9. We probably won't get into 9 tonight. Um, what is this particular designation of the ministry of Jesus at this point? What generally is it called, if I remember? What was the biggest part of his ministry? The Galilean ministry. And so after that, when the pressure gets increased on that, he leaves, and so this period's called the withdrawal to the north. He doesn't just stay in the north, but there are certain things that will happen that end up making this uh, a designation of this particular period. So we've seen Jesus withdraw from Galilee. It doesn't mean he's not going to go back to Galilee, but when he does, he kind of wants to stay incognito. Uh, he, he's not going to engage in uh, more grand um, healing uh, opportunities. He doesn't want to draw attention to himself. So staying under the radar, uh, staying in the outskirts. Uh, we've seen Jesus go to Caesarea, not Caesarea Philippi, that's tonight. We see him go to the area of Tyre and Sidon and interact with the Syrophoenician woman there. And then he comes back around the north side of the Sea of Galilee to Decapolis. Uh, and then he travels back across the Sea of Galilee. About the minute he steps foot uh, back in Galilee, the Pharisees are waiting for him. And we talked about this in our uh, live stream Sunday. Uh, this would be chapter 8 of Mark, verses 11 and 12, which is an abbreviated version of what Matthew actually has. But what was the request of the people, the Pharisees, Actually, it was Pharisees and Sadducees. What was the request of Jesus when he disembarks and steps foot back in Galilee? Show us a sign. Show, like he hasn't shown signs, but show us a sign. And so he calls them an evil and adulterous generation because they are seeing, but they're not seeing. They're observing what's happening, but they're doing it so prejudicially that it isn't making an impact on them. So Jesus basically rebuffs them. No sign is going to be given to you except the sign of the prophet Jonah, and he doesn't elaborate on that uh, at the time. And so it's, it's back in the boat, uh, and he's sailing across to Bethsaida. So he'd been in the area of Magdala, which is on the western side. Now he's sailing to the north side of the sea, uh, he comes to Bethsaida. So this brings us to uh, Mark chapter 8 uh, in verses 22 through 26. John, would you read those for us, please? Mark 8, 22 through 26. Okay. All right, so now we're in Bethsaida. Blind man is brought. Um, what is interesting to you about this particular episode of healing? It was a uh, tool to be used. It was a simply two steps. This is the first time we've really seen it. Yeah. I don't know if there's another time we do. I don't think so. so part A, part B. It is different. What else is different? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what did he do besides speak? Huh? He spits. 
laid hands on him, okay? And then he, he questions him about what he is seeing. We talked about this a little bit previously. This is point 1B in your notes uh, about the, we'll say, techniques the accompanying actions or words that Jesus uses when he's doing these miracles, whether it's healings or other things that he does. Uh, it's not explained why he does things differently uh, from one of these episodes to the other. So we're sort of left to speculate. And so we need to be careful not to bind a speculation. But I do think one thing we can observe, whether it is the reason or not, but one thing we can observe about these things is something quite different than what is observed in the modern healing healing service. And that is there is a, um, a methodology. There's uh, sensory elements to what I will call psychosomatic uh, healings and other um, supposed divine phenomena that are happening. And I think f it's fairly easy to an objective observer what's going on in the modern day healing service with music, with lighting, with intonations of voice. You're creating uh, an emotional uh, crescendo. You're involving people on an emotional level and basically trying to convince them that something is happening to them. And it can have a, a temporary effect on people. There are people that uh, might have come in a wheelchair and they might struggle to their feet and stand for a few seconds. But as I've said many times before, if there's a, a faith healer today that could just cure a case of chicken pox, I mean, he could write his own ticket. Uh, he would be world famous. Just, just, just the minimum. Just how about chicken pox? It doesn't have to be leprosy. And obviously, these kinds of things can't be done today. So, at least by pure observation, you can see there's a difference between what Jesus does and what these people today do that are trying to create an atmosphere. So, to speaking to that part of this, you can see that Jesus doesn't create an atmosphere. He takes different people in different ways and applies divine power to them. Sometimes we have said uh, there's not even apparently a conscious action on Jesus' part. The woman reaches out in the crowd and touches his robe and she's healed. Or it may be that he, he raises somebody from the dead. They can't respond to him anyway. They're dead. So sometimes he has the person do something. Uh, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Sometimes there's nothing that they have to do. Sometimes it's a spoken word. Sometimes it's spitting in their eyes. Sometimes it's putting his fingers in their ears like we saw on Sunday with the deaf stutterer. I'd be interested to entertain any other thoughts y'all have on this. But, you know, the speculation there simply is in opposition to what we see today by charlatans who claim to do that. Does anybody else have any ideas about why Jesus does things differently seemingly every time he works a miracle? Yeah, I, I would grant that too. I mean, they're, they're learning, I think, something about divine power in all of this. They're learning it's not a hocus-pocus kind of a thing. It's not about building an atmosphere. It's about the power of God and yielding to that power, which Jesus does, but he doesn't do it in a formulaic sense.
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, sometimes he's in the middle of a crowd. Remember the guy let down through the roof? He's sitting there in the middle of a crowd and does something to prove a point to the crowd, right? But then there's a case like this where it's really not for the crowd. It seems to be more for the person. And so he focuses on that. So, you know, again, these are the challenges that we have. Uh, I, I think we, I don't, I don't think we always appreciate this about the Gospels and about the life of Jesus in general. It's not easy to figure out what's going on. You know, we, we tend to hear or maybe think ourselves, well, you just kind of read it and take it for what it says. Well, I think rarely you can just take it for what it says. I mean, it says what it says, I know that. But you don't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John giving you a running commentary on what Jesus meant when he said so-and-so. Here's the explanation of why Jesus did so-and-so. You don't get that. You get more of the who, what, where, you know, when. You don't get a lot of the why. And you don't always get a, rarely, I think, do you get a connection between a given element of what Jesus is doing, and then you get the explanation for that. So remember, they didn't get it either, right? They're with him. They're listening to him, and they don't understand what's happening a good part of the time. They're still not going to understand it thoroughly. We'll see that example here shortly. So, you know, the Gospels are not, I think, quite as straightforward as we might think they are. We don't have a lot of explanation. And it may be that part of the challenge of figuring out what's going on is then you have to take uh, a situation, an interchange, a teaching of Jesus, and then go to the rest of the New Testament and say, how does that fit in with what Paul later says, or John later says, or Peter later says? How do we, how do we take the words of Jesus and his teaching, which doesn't come with a lot of explanation, and then weave it into sort of a new covenant um, principle? And you can't, you know, you can't do it very effectively, in my opinion, just by reading what Jesus did or what Jesus taught. There's a lot more commentary on that that comes from Acts on. So he does something a little unusual here. Uh, as Chris said, it's unusual from the standpoint that this is kind of healing you know, part A and part B. It isn't a failure, right? So let's not co-op this, as some might do, uh, and, and try to use it as you know, some kind of blame on the person being healed for the failure, it isn't a failure. It does come in two parts. Why? I have no idea. What does it mean I see people like trees walking around? I, I don't know. Um, I don't know what this man had in his mind um, in terms of what things were supposed to look like when his sight came back. I was trying to read and see. Did it say he was blind from birth? I didn't remember that. So... Sorry? Yeah. Perhaps. Um, but how old was he when he went blind, if that's the case? I don't know. I don't know what he was expecting to see. But his description, you know, isn't one seemingly of clarity. And then, you know, a, a secondary element to this uh, healing restores him to full sight. So again... It's just, there's not a cookie cutter, you know, this is always what happens when Jesus heals somebody. But note, he was healed. Um, maybe, you know, I, I think that's probably, I'd have to go back and think about it. I think that's probably a true statement. I think the one difference to me would be with Jesus, it's compressed, right? And you've got lots and lots of healings or other miracles being done in a short space. So then you kind of wonder, you know, why is it with every one of these episodes, it's clearly he's not doing the same thing over and over again. And so it just, you know, brings up a question in my mind, why... Is there a touch with this one and there's, you know, not a touch with that one? Why is there this, you know, spitting on the ground and making clay 
and there's not in another one. It just, it's, it's a little odd that uh, it happens differently every time. And we don't have an explanation for it. But yeah, I'm, I think you're basically right. I don't know. If we think about the Old Testament, I don't know that there's any you know, formulaic way of miracles happening then either. All right. Uh, let's consider what, what's going to happen here um, from verses 27 through 30 of Mark 8. But I also at this point want to go to Matthew 16. And let's look at Matthew 16 because... Um, there's more detail of what's happening here. But if we look at our map, uh, the relief map here, you see Mount Hermon all the way over on the right side of the chart. Uh, 9,232 feet. That's pretty high, especially being fairly close to the coast. So it's like you come in from the Mediterranean, you know, you go up to Mount Hermon. And um, I don't think I've got any photos of it here, but... Uh, we've said before it was snow covered a good part of the year, if not perhaps some years, all year. Um, Caesarea Philippi, which is where this next section is going to take place, is north of the Sea of Galilee, kind of in the foothills leading up to Mount Hermon. And so that's where Jesus is going to sort of withdraw with his disciples. And he has this conversation that we read about here and in Matthew 16. Let me put this one up, too. Okay, so there you see Caesarea Philippi toward the top, Mount Hermon at the very top. And this area on the north side of the Sea of Galilee would be where the, the feeders are for the Sea of Galilee. They would, the snow would run off of Mount Hermon and come into the Sea of Galilee from the north. Then, obviously, it flows out the south as the Jordan River and then flows into the Dead Sea. Uh, so, as I would understand it, the Sea of Galilee would have been pretty pristine because of the waters that are feeding it, quite the opposite of what you find in the Dead Sea because there's no outlet, and so everything stagnates and you get the evaporation and all the minerals and whatnot are left behind, and it's just, uh, you know, an awful body of water. Dead Sea, well-named. So this is, Jesus is now, so part of this withdrawal to the north, okay? They're, they're traveling up toward Caesarea Philippi. Something I read today suggested that this would have been a, a city with a high Gentile population, not absent Jews, but it would have been more Gentile than Jew. Uh, just like we saw earlier with Jesus spending a little bit of time with a Syrophoenician woman. Uh, he, he did say, remember, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's the main focus of what he's doing. But it doesn't mean that he never interacted with a Gentile, or in this case, he's wanting to withdraw from the Jews because they're making life very difficult for him and putting a lot of pressure on him, and it is not time yet for him to die, although it is drawing uh, a lot closer. Um, so let's see. Let's look at Matthew 16. Um, We'll, we'll look at uh, 13 through 20. Randy, you feel up to reading? Matthew 16, 13 through 20. All right, so this is a <clears throat> pretty well-known passage of Scripture <coughs> based especially on Peter's confession. It's also a bedrock passage of Catholicism and a battleground. 
because of what Catholics claim this is teaching about Peter and, and uh, papal authority. So uh, it's a pretty significant passage, but just, you know, kind of, I, I think part of what we're trying to do here is, is imprint on our minds. You know, where does some of this take place? And at what part of the ministry of Jesus does it take place? Because I think if we don't study in some kind of a harmony form, which we're not necessarily doing in this class, we're just looking at Mark. But if we don't study in a harmony form, then I think what tends to happen is the Gospels just sort of blend together in an indistinct bunch of stuff. And we don't really have a geographical or chronological view of how Jesus' life lays out. So it all just kind of lumps together, and we find it difficult to say where Jesus was when this happened, or what came before this when Jesus taught something. And so I, I hope that at least what we're doing with Mark and what we have done at other times with a harmony study will help us begin to delineate where is Jesus when this happens? Where is Jesus when this is taught? What's happened before that may have a bearing on what he's saying? And I think if we can work toward that, we can see the life of Jesus in some kind of sequential form. We're going to have a better idea at separating the episodes that happen in the life of Jesus. Okay, so... If I were to ask you about Matthew 16 and, and what's the nature of Peter's confession, pretty much everybody in here could have said it. But if I were to have asked you before class tonight, where did that happen? Would you have been able to answer that? Where was Peter when he said this? At what point in the ministry of Jesus did that happen? Because what we've been seeing is the disciples have a real difficult time understanding who Jesus is. And, and it's interesting to see how Jesus approaches this on this occasion. Because before they were saying things like, who can this man be that even the wind and the waves obey him? They're identifying Jesus with a question. Who can this be? Now, it doesn't mean they haven't said before that Jesus is the Son of God. Peter actually just said it, but it comes in John 6. It doesn't come in Mark. Remember we said after Jesus fed the 5,000 and they wanted to take him and make him a king by force? And in John 6, he started teaching, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not have everlasting life. And he says this over and over in various contexts in John 6. And at the end of that, they just kind of scratch their heads and say, this guy's crazy. And they just walk away. And what did Jesus do? He said, are you going to go away too to the disciples? And what did Peter say? You have the words of eternal life. So there has been a growing understanding on their part of who Jesus is and where he's come from, that he's more than just a prophet. And you see that here. But specifically now he's asking them, what is the prevailing concept among people of, of who I am? It's interesting that you see the same person with the same teaching doing the same things. Everybody sees this. And yet you have such wide, divergent views on who he is and how deeply this significance goes in their minds as to who he is. So who do men say that I am? And they're in the region of Caesarea Philippi when, when Jesus questions them about this. Well, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So people were all over the map on this. You know, there's at least Old Testament justification, especially for uh, Elijah coming back, because in prophecy um, that was said in the Old Testament, referring to John the Baptist. Uh, but... You know, Herod thought that Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead, so we considered that as we talked about chapter 6 and what, you know, Herod had done to John and beheading him. But he's, he's setting them up. He, he knows what people are saying about who he is. He's not asking for information. 
he's getting their wheels turning. What do people say about me? Well, some say this, some say that. But what do you think? And so after this interchange here, we're going to find that Jesus starts teaching them more directly about dying. I'm going to go to Jerusalem, going to be rejected by the chief priests and scribes, going to be killed, but I'm going to be raised on the third day. So even though, you know, we're in John 8 by chapter number, we're about halfway through the book, but we're already late in the ministry of Jesus. And he's now trying to prepare them for what's going to be happening. So you get the question, who do you say that I am? And notice, just from the outset, this discussion is focused on him. That becomes important when we try to figure out what he means uh, a little bit further down. The discussion is about him. Who am I? Who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter gets it right. Verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we've been seeing a gradual awakening in their minds of who Jesus is in, in fullness. So in this description, we have a couple of things. We've got the Messiah. We've got the Old Testament prophecies that talk about one coming, especially maybe thinking of uh, the prophecies of Isaiah, but he's not the only one. But you're the anointed one of God. You are the Messiah, the Christ. You're the son of the living God. God portrays himself all through the Old Testament as being the living God over and against the dead idols. There's no life in those idols. They can't tell you the past. They can't tell you the future. And they can't do anything. Think of you know, the prophets of Baal and Asherah on Mount Carmel with Elijah's great confrontation. They couldn't do anything. And those men are out cutting themselves and dancing around and whirling around and nothing. Because there's no substance to them. But God is the living God. God is the one that's actually making things happen, as it were. He's the creator. He's the spiritual guide of what is transpiring in the Old Testament bringing about all these promises that he had made to Abraham. And so Peter, again, how much does he understand? Well, he's going to do a major flip-flop here in a minute. But at least on some level, he's getting a deeper view of Jesus. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. So here's where it gets uh, a little bit, I'd say a little bit foggy, but it's only foggy because of what men try to do with this passage. What Jesus actually said isn't really that complicated. But it's like any other passage. When you get a false idea attached to it, you get somebody, you know, maybe there's any number of passages we can come up with, and you think, you know, there's a false teaching associated with that, and you think, how did they ever get that out of that passage? And it basically is called proof texting. They needed a passage that sort of sounded like the point, you know, that they wanted to make. And so you take a passage and you kind of twist it and shave a little bit off here and grind a little bit over there and you stuff it into your doctrine to make it sound like your doctrine. And so what's actually said here, it really isn't all that difficult unless you, you've got hundreds of years uh, of twisting and turning and torturing this passage to make it say something it, it doesn't say. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. What's Bar mean at the beginning of a name? Son of. Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. What do you call that? Flesh and blood. Huh? Yeah, man, it's a metonymy. Okay. We are comprised physically of flesh and blood. We're also a spiritual being, but this becomes a metonymy for man. So flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So we talk about looking out for not buts when you're studying. Pay attention to a not but comparison. Uh, is this an absolute or a relative not but? It's absolute, okay? 
God is the only one who could demonstrate that Jesus is his son. So Peter, you didn't get that from any human source, period. Absolutely no human source. So the not but here is absolute. It is not relative. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Isn't it interesting as you think about this? He's just been challenged again by the Pharisees and the Sadducees from Matthew's account in Matthew 16 to work a sign from heaven. And he's been working signs from heaven. He's been demonstrating from heaven, from heaven's power, who he is. And those that do not want to uh, uh, accept that conclusion dismiss everything that God has been doing to prove who Jesus is. They dismiss that and ask for something else. And that's just pretty indicative of how we are as human beings. You know, it may be that you're having a discussion with someone, it's, you know, of a doctrinal nature, and you show them a passage, and they find a way to dismiss it, and it's like, well, show me something else. Well, how many verses do you need? How many verses do I have to show you that teach that truth? And you get kind of frustrated sometimes because, well, that verse doesn't work in their mind. That verse doesn't work. That verse doesn't work. To a, a mind that is not open to the truth, even God's testimony will be rejected. And this is kind of what Peter's going to end up preaching, isn't it, on the day of Pentecost? God attested to him with signs and wonders and miracles, but you still rejected him. I mean, that's, that's where he starts pretty much. In the Sermon on the Mount, he quotes from Joel, but then he moves into uh, condemnation of them. And it's over and against what God had proved. So when Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus says, you're right, and you didn't learn that from any man. You learned it from God. Because God has been attesting to me. And then he uses a play on Peter's name, at least a resemblance, the, the, the two words we're going to look at here come from the same root, but all he's doing is playing off Peter's name to contrast something. And I say to you that you are Peter, you are Petros, which is the masculine form of the word here. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. So herein lies... There's not really a discrepancy, but it's kind of made into one. You've got Petros, masculine. You've got Petra, uh, feminine. So we've got two different words. Okay, they have, a, they have a commonality. But Peter's name represents something that is a detached piece of stone. Something that perhaps might be holdable, but yet something strong. And then the Petra here is a rock shelf, a ledge, bedrock. It's what's underneath the ground. So all Jesus is doing is playing off of these. You know, the one who just made the confession, yeah, you got that right. The confession you made is solid. Petros, Peter. But what you said has great weight, great significance foundational strength. And he says on this rock, okay? So imagine how this, if, if, you, if he, he's giving here the, the basis of Peter being the first pope and the church being built on Peter, think of what might have been said. You are Peter and on you I will build my church. Wouldn't that have been easy? On you I will build my church. But what he says is, this rock, on this rock, I will build my church. And by the way, the word this matches in gender to Petra, not Petros, not Peter. On this rock, it's a rock other than Peter. You are Peter, but on this rock, I will build my church. Not on you, Peter. And almost to emphasize that, 
The story then turns into Peter rebuking the Lord for saying he's going to die. What an unstable foundation Peter would have been for the church. But besides that, unless you just want to make a doctrine out of this, where is the concept in the New Testament that the church is going to be built on a pure human being? You know, that's a completely foreign concept when you think about what the church is. What is the church? It's a, it's a group of redeemed people called out of the world. What redeemed them? Peter? Peter redeemed people? Peter didn't die till after the church was well in existence and people were already being saved and forgiven. Peter dies somewhere later on in the first century, so apparently it wasn't his death that was being preached to people. And what efficacy would there be in the shedding of Peter's blood since he was a sinner? We see evidence of that in the New Testament. We see evidence of his ignorance. We see evidence of his carnal thinking. We, in other words, we see in Peter a human. So why in the world would Jesus say on you, Peter, I will build my church when the church is redeemed people saved from their sins. What does Peter have that Abraham didn't have, that Moses didn't have, that David didn't have? What did Peter have that would have made a fit foundation for a church and for redemption that the greats of the Old Testament didn't have? And yet they couldn't have redemption built on them because they were all sinners too. So, you are Peter. He's a rock. He doesn't say you're just shifting sand, Peter. Remember, Jesus is the one that named him Petros before Peter ever did anything. And Peter is going to become a great man in the kingdom. No question about that. Peter will be the one to preach the gospel first to the Jews. He'll be the one to preach the gospel first to the Gentiles. But even after the apostolic age is well underway, Peter fails again in Galatians 2, when Paul has to rebuke him. So why in the world would anybody reading the New Testament without a preconception come away with the idea that God built the church on Peter, a man, when the Son of God is right there in the midst of everybody? Why would you ever end up with that idea unless you were trying to prove something? And there's nothing here about a pope. There's nothing here about papal authority. There's nothing here about Peter dominating or ruling. Or It just, folks, it's not here. You have to read into what's going on here. So you are Peter, but on this rock, a contrasting uh, gender connection of the words, this is being feminine, not masculine, which takes it back to Petra. On this rock, on this confession that you just said, I am the Son of God, on that, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Um, the, the old rendition of this word here, in Greek it is Hades, so it's a transliterated word. But the old King James uh, scholars translated it by the English term hell. So that's a, that is a misnomer in terms of what is actually being said here. And so think about what um, Peter quotes in Acts 2. Well, let's just turn over and read it real quick. Because here he is now exercising what we'll read here in a minute. He has the keys of the kingdom. So exercising those keys in Acts 2, he's quoting from David in uh, the book of Psalms. Uh, and he says, I foresaw the Lord always, this is verse 29, uh, 25, um, before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, uh, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh will also rest in hope because you will not leave my soul in Hades. 
nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. The gates of Hades, there's been different things made out of this. Again, I don't, I don't think it's all that difficult. Gates hold you in or gates keep you out. When Jesus died, Jesus' spirit went to Hades. It did not go to hell. That is a common misconception based on the old King James. Jesus, Jesus would not go to hell. There's no, uh, no circumstance whatsoever that would send Jesus to hell. He did go to the realm generally called the realm of the unseen. It's the Old Testament Sheol. It's the New Testament Hades. It's where all souls go when you leave this world. They must be somewhere. Spirits of men don't just float around. We don't haunt houses and scare people and get back at the people that treated us badly. When our soul leaves the body, it leaves the realm of creation, and it goes to Hades, where our soul remains until we are reunited with our body at the resurrection. Jesus' spirit, what does he, what does he say to the thief on the cross today? What? You will be with me somewhere else. We're not going to be here. We're going to die. Today you'll be with me in paradise. And so the gates of hell, I'm sorry, Hades, that hold people who die unless God intervenes. Because Jesus brought people back from the dead, did he not? So he brought their souls out of Hades. <clears throat> but... Sadly or not, they would have to die again. I suppose it's not all that sad because they would get to live longer, but they're going to have to experience death again. But not so with Jesus. The gates of Hades will not prevent my death. Where my spirit is going to go when my body expires is not going to prevent the building of my church. So a couple of things on, on that. I'll build my church. Can anybody remember the, the only one other place in the Gospels Jesus uses the term church? Because there's only two, and this is one of them. Oh, come on, extra credit. You get the car. You get this right. My brother offends me. What do I do? Go to him alone. Take one or two others. Tell it to the church. Okay, Matthew 18. So the only two times Jesus uses the term church, that doesn't mean it's an in insignificant word. But he uses the term kingdom most of the time. Now, we're not going into this, but premillennialists have a field day with this because they want to try to say that Jesus changed his terminology because he's no longer offering the kingdom. He decided to offer the church instead, and it's a parenthetical stopgap measure because the Jews rejected his offer of the kingdom, blah, blah, blah. That's kind of like this being the pope in Matthew 16. The only way you can get there is if you start with the idea and then you try to cram it somewhere in the Bible. So the term church is a group of called out people, an assembly of people. It was a secular word. It was not a religious word. It was a secular word that described the gathering of people for a riot, for a social event, for a political gathering, people in the arena. That was a, an ecclesia because they were being called out from society for a particular reason of being together. And the Holy Spirit took that secular word, like many others in Koine Greek, and he said, I'm putting a spiritual significance on that word. I'm going to say it's people called out of the world, redeemed from their sins. They come together in one body. They belong to Christ. That is the ecclesia in, in a spiritual sense. So Jesus says, I will build my church. Build is an interesting term because we immediately think of some kind of physical structure. But that's not what's happening and the rest of New Testament history bears that out. Jesus said, I'm going to make it possible for people to come out of sin's dominion, to come out from under Satan's control. I'm going to enable them to come out from the world that they don't share the values with anymore. And I'm going to bring them into a relationship with me. That's done on Peter. You see, what becomes clear to me about the Catholic argument about this is they only mean it in an ecclesiastical sense. Peter became the Pope, and he got power and authority. And he was able to pass that papal authority on to his successors. That's what they mean by it. 
It's all about power. When Jesus says it, it's about salvation. My church is going to be built on me because I'm the only one that's got the power in, the, in my death to forgive sin. Peter doesn't have that power. The Catholic Church only wants to look at this passage from one standpoint. Who got the power when Jesus left? Oh, Peter got it. He's the first pope, and then it passes on in succession to all popes since. This isn't what Jesus is talking about at all. I'm going to build a called out group of people who are going to be my body. My body, not Peter's body. My body. What does Paul say? Jesus is the head and we are the body. He doesn't say anything about Peter in 1 Corinthians 12. All right, so I will build my church, which also tells us what else in that phrase is so about the church. It's his. I will build it. It ought to wear his name, not Martin Luther's or anybody else's. But it hasn't happened yet, has it? I will build. So something significant is going to have to happen in order to have that outcome. And we in this assembly would know what that is. So, um, and I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. You here is singular. But in Matthew 18, it's plural. It's the same phrase. It's the plural you instead of the singular you. Why is it singular here? Because Jesus is making Peter the first pope. It's singular here because he's having a conversation with Peter. I'm going to give to you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom. And besides that, Peter got those keys in a singularly unique situation. Because he preached in Acts 2... And he preached in Acts 10. Nobody else went to the Gentiles. Nobody else preached to the assembly on... Now, all the apostles were preaching in Acts 2, because it says so. But when it came, you know, when the rubber met the road, and they were accused of being drunk, and one man got up and spoke, and at the end of that, people were baptized and became part of the church for the first time, that was Peter doing that. So Peter did have a singularly unique role, but it wasn't unique in the standpoint that he had power over the others. It's clear, you know, we've said before, the title for the book of Acts is a little bit of a misnomer. It should be the Acts of Peter and Paul. That's what the book of Acts is about. What did all these other apostles do? Who knows? There's a lot of secular history about them, but not inspired history. So, Acts is about Peter and Paul. Peter was very significant in the historical record. But that doesn't make him the Pope, and that doesn't mean he's above the other apostles. And that probably was part of the reasoning in 1 Corinthians 1 through 4 about breaking up in sex, and I'm of Peter, and I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos. Again, you can imagine how that would have gone. Oh, I am of Peter because... Peter was with the Lord. I'm not, you want to be a Paulite, you can be a Paulite, but you know, he was killing Christians and he didn't know the Lord. He wasn't on the Sea of Galilee with the Lord. So, neither Peter nor Paul has any kind of standing over the other. In Galatians 1 and 2, you have the account of them meeting together and agreeing from I think looking back at Acts 15, Peter, you do what you're doing. You concentrate on the Jews. Paul, you do what you're doing. You concentrate on the Gentiles. It's not a hierarchy. Remember Jesus said, don't do that. That's what the Gentiles do. Don't do that. I'm your Lord. I'm your master. He doesn't then just turn around and make Peter Lord or Pope. But he does give him the keys of the kingdom, but he gives the keys of the kingdom to all the apostles, at least for, so insofar as being original revealers. In a secondary sense, you and I exercise the keys of the kingdom when we take what's already given and we teach somebody the truth and they obey the gospel. We've given them the keys of the kingdom in that sense. We've opened the door to the kingdom for them. 
But it, nothing originated with me in that. And nothing originated with Peter. Nothing originated with Paul. It came from the Holy Spirit. Whatever you bind on earth, and again, I, you know, this is, you read over and over, and I don't, I don't doubt it, I don't question it. The verb tenses here. Whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Does anybody have a, a New American Standard? Yeah, Carl, what is it? Does it read any differently in verse 19? Shall be bound? Okay. So most of what I've read on this, the terminology should be shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Okay, that's a footnote. So that's pointing to what was already settled in heaven in the, in the mind of God. It's what's given to Peter. Okay, Peter's not the originator. Oh, Peter, whatever you bind on earth, God is now bound to bind in heaven. No, that's not what it's saying. It's saying God has already determined what the truth is, and Peter, it's going to be given to you by the Holy Spirit. So the binding and the loosing is going to be heaven binding and loosing through... Peter, who is the instrument. What puzzles me about that, though I think that's true, is other than the, the New American Standard, the versions don't read like that. And I, I don't know why they don't. Because if you read Greek scholars and you look at the tenses, it does apparently say, shall have been bound. But I don't, I'm, I'm at a loss as to why nobody seems to want to translate it that way, maybe other than the New American Standard. But the idea is, is not Peter determined. I mean, when has that ever been? Moses did not issue unilaterally the law of Moses. It's even called the law of Moses. It didn't originate with Moses. He's the mediator. When has man ever been the originator of law that binds God? I mean, really? That is such a foreign concept to Scripture. All right, so then it, we read here, he commanded the disciples they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. He, again, this is not a time in his ministry where he needs publicity. All right, it's 8.30. Uh, I wanted to get a little bit further, but we'll, we'll finish this up uh, in our live streams. Anybody have a closing question or thought on what we've talked about tonight? All right, thanks for coming. Y'all have a good evening. Ugh. <clears throat>